I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and Mrs. Treadway, if you would do the roll call, please. Here. Oh, Here. 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 Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Recognition and thank you, Dr. Carlson. Thank you. Two recognitions this evening. One is from Chalk It Up Company in West Salem, and we are so appreciative of their donation once again, their continued support to our school district. Chalk It Up donated over $750 worth of access merchandise to our elementary schools. So a variety of supplies, books, stickers, and uh, uh, greatly appreciated. Second, Kathy Gowdy, we want to show our thank, thank her and show our appreciation to her, who has donated $300 to the Home and Student Universal Nutrition Program in memory of her mother, Rose Bjorki, who some of you or perhaps many of you know. Rose was a cook in the district for over 30 years. The funds will be used to fund the purchase of a salad bar for students at Viking Elementary. So we appreciate a memory of Rose and the years of service uh, that she gave. Uh, so thank you, Kathy, in, in a memory of her mom, Rose. That is it. Well, and I would like to echo those appreciation. I know that <clears throat> Holman School District is the quality district it is because of the support that we receive from not only our staff but our community our parents um, and businesses in the community so thank you for all that you do next item is public participation is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time we ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed please come forward state your name address and topic to be addressed mr clark Good evening. Uh, my name is Jay Clark, uh, W7312 Sylvester Road, Holman, Wisconsin. I'm here tonight. Um, get the, to present the results of the pork feed for education 2012. Uh, this is an activity that's been organized for the, the last 11 years now by the leadership team. Actually, in the earlier years, uh, organized by other groups of employees, been in recent years by the leadership team, and takes place uh, at the homecoming game. And we'd like to start by showing our appreciation and thank yous for the sponsors that contributed to the event. Uh, we had sponsors, corporate sponsors, in the local banking institutions, uh, total of $3,000. And here you can see those local banking institutions that uh, helped uh, donate dollars to make uh, this event possible. They've been uh, very generous donors, uh, all of them, for, for many years. Uh, here's some pictures. Uh, one in the top center shows the high school marching band play. It added kind of a collegiate feel to the event this year because uh, our marching band showed up uh, a little bit after 6 o'clock and uh, serenaded us for 20 minutes or so with uh, great choices of high school music and uh, just was really fun. I saw young children who were there with their parents uh, looking at the marching band members and I just think it was a great opportunity for our marching band to get a little bit of publicity and recognition uh, as well as make the experience a little bit more enjoyable for uh, those who are at the park field. And you might recognize some other familiar faces of people that you see in there. Uh, Rich Vonstead showed up again uh, this year. He's a repeat customer. We love having Rich show up. Um, while the <clears throat> one of the purposes of the event is to just bring a great opportunity for people to enjoy themselves at homecoming, um, there's some financial um, benefits to doing it too in the form of donations that we make to groups. Um, 
the Holman High School Athletic Department for um, having the event for us to even have this uh, pork feed. Um, uh, we provide $250 uh, to the, directly to the athletic department for them to use to meet the needs of the athletic department. We send a $200 check to the Holman FFA. They're kind enough to work collaboratively with us on that night. They generally do the concessions uh, at the football games. And uh, uh, we're there uh, working to serve the same group of people. And so um, we make a check out to them uh, as in the spirit of cooperation. And then the remaining proceeds, uh, $4,824.41, will be donating to the Holman Area Foundation, where we know they'll put that to good use to uh, help the students and the instructional programs in the district. This is down a little bit from what it has been recent years. Um, we had some greater expenses. We had a cold night and a windy night, and you know, we thought it important that people be comfortable while we were there, so spent about $450 on that wall tent, allowed people to dine, and uh, it's actually kind of warm and cozy. And, um, uh, the numbers were down, and we attribute that uh, in many ways to the weather uh, as well. But we're excited, and I know that those who were there uh, enjoyed the event. So 11-year total is uh, $53,565 um, in uh, contributions and donations to the foundation and those programs uh, previously mentioned at the high school. So we have a ceremonial check, and uh, I'd like to present that to President Hancock, if you would I'd love to accept that on behalf of the leadership team, and uh, I'm hoping there's no photo around here. First join us in that. So thank you. Oh, for, thank we you just had a great time. I hope everybody who attended did as well. Thank you very much. This is wonderful. <laughs> trying to figure out if there's a way to hold it up. But. <laughs> no, thank you, Mr. Clark. We is very, very much appreciated. And I think I called it the pig feed last week at the last meeting, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I think it's a, you know, it's a great event. And I love that so many of our staff members and, and parents volunteer from all across the different lines of um, activities and events. And, I know that those monies having been on the foundation, then those monies go right back into uh, the school district's hands through the Viking um, Fund for Excellence. So thank you so very much. And um, I look forward to hearing all the good things that the foundation does with that. So, okay. So is there anyone else who would like to speak under public participation, present a large check or do anything fun <laughs> like that? <laughs> Okay, I don't see anyone else coming forward. So then we'll move on to reports and discussion, pupil services. Uh, Mrs. Krakow, I think for at-risk report. Good evening. I do wish I had some money to bring to, but <laughs> I don't. Um, I'm here this evening to just give a short update on our at-risk um, and alternative education programs. The official term when talking about at-risk programs is children at risk of not graduating from high school. Students in grades 5 through 12 are identified as at risk of not graduating from high school because they have dropped out or because two or more of the following are true. They might be two or more years behind in the number of credits they have earned, two or more years behind in basic skill levels. They might be habitually truant. They might be parents. They could be adjudicated. If they're in eighth grade, their WKCE scores in each subject area are below basic level or they have been failed to be promoted to the ninth grade. Here in Holman, there are things we do for all students at all levels. We use response to intervention and PBIS, which includes selected and targeted interventions with some of the staff that you see listed here. We use educational support teams, which meet to determine the best approaches to intervention. And we develop behavior plans 
for students who need behavioral support. At times, there may be a student who is unable to come to school because of specific medical issues, in which cases we consider homebound services. Alternative education meets the needs of students who are at risk of not graduating from high school, vulnerable, or disengaged. The long-term goal of alternative education is to identify successful strategies and to use those strategies to improve learning opportunities for all children. At the middle school level, Pathways is an academic and behavioral program for students who are at risk. And at the high school level, our new Academy on the Prairie serves our at-risk students. Basically, we provide at-risk programming in all of the schools in Holman. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? No, thank you very much. Okay, then buildings and grounds and our energy report, Mr. Daly. I don't have the new Windows version yet, so I'm not used to this one. <laughs> um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you um, about my annual report, the results measures for 2011-12, what I plan to do this year. I have a brief energy report and then some information on the uh, high school boiler replacement installation bid at the end of this report. And. Um, um, in 2011-12 annual report, you'll find this uh, result measure in the uh, annual report. It gives us a cost of the buildings and grounds program um, of the classroom physical <coughs> environment. Um, we, we look at the importance of this as, as it is important for us to uh, um, to remember that a significant portion of our budget is 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 maintenance dollars and, and uh, um, utility dollars, but costs can't be uh, separated from importance of the efficient and effective operation um, of those dollars. Support services vision and mission statement tells us we should be stewards of our community resources, and stewardship not only applies to the annual operation costs, but also in the maintenance of our facilities. The most appropriate way then to measure this is, is to do a cost per square foot. So we compare ourselves how much we spend dollar-wise in that part of the budget compared to other districts in our conference. Um, so uh, our measure method is, is calculating the cost per square foot again um, in the general and community service funds. We don't include 42 fund um, or construction funds in this calculation. Um, there are a number of variables. Um, the standard of cleaning that's expected is a variable from school district to school district, community use of facilities. Um, the cost of utilities is affected by such thing as degree days and, and, uh, um, and seasonal issues such as snow and ice, lack of rain may affect operational costs. Um, Facilities that are spread out over large distances like ours naturally have a higher cost than a campus style of school. And then, and then another variable between us and, and who we compare ourselves to is our capital improvements that we spend compared to what they may spend. The district target is to rank favorably with our neighboring district districts for this report <coughs> compared ourselves to the MVC school districts. Um, comparing this gives us an indication of our efficiency relative to nearby um, districts. Um, 
in, in over the last six years, our, our trend has been, has relatively stayed the same. Um, and uh, we are, according to this graph, and you can see that, lower than <coughs> the rest of the MBC average. The MBC average is $5.84 per square foot for the buildings and grounds, and we're at $4.95. Uh, if you were with us um, in our Buildings and Grounds Committee meeting this afternoon, there might be a reason why we're that low, because we do spend less money on capital improvements, I believe, um, than other districts do. The other thing we, uh, we measure and is reported on is the classroom physical environment. Um, these things include things like temperature, humidity, uh, light, um, uh, carbon dioxide uh, levels, which tells us if we're getting enough fresh air into the classroom, since obviously it's important that we, we have a good learning environment for our students. And, and the targets are, are, are uh, uh, the targets we're looking for are, some of them are set by the board, for instance, we have a policy on what our temperature should be in our classrooms, heating and cooling. Um, where ASHRAE says tells us uh, what our CO2 should be and then um, we know uh, we have uh, uh, recommendations for lighting and such uh, the measurements um, these last two years were taken during the during the heating season and temperatures were were at a standards lighting was above standards or at standards CO2 was well within ASHRAE limits humidity below the 60% maximum. So we're doing very well in those. Um, next year, um, the results measures will be continuing to, to uh, um, analyze the cost per square foot. In fact, we're, what I'm going to do is break down that cost per, per square foot and deep, uh, dive into that a little bit deeper and, and see where we're doing well and where we can improve. We also looking at the uh, middle school capacity, student capacity, much as what we did um, last year with the high school. And I've got a brief energy report. Um, this graph shows you our annual utility costs. Uh, we started our energy program back in 2005 and six, um, and it kind of goes up and down, up. A, the last couple of years have been a, a little <laughs> higher, but we have new schools online and, and we do um, have uh, uh, air conditioning in spaces we didn't when we started this. Um, what's, this one is really kind of telling. This tells us um, our kilowatt, um, our, our kilowatt usage per year. Um, you can see before we started our program, we were over 5.8 5 million kilowatt hours and we drop that down and continue to keep it low um, even with the new buildings put online this is our natural gas uh, yearly usage and this is a calendar year um, and that kind of goes up and down. that's much more weather responsive to weather than than the electricity is I don't have 2012 on here yet but I expect 2012 to be pretty low once we get to through December, uh, we had a pretty easy January, February, March this year. We do still maintain in, in, in uh, the uh, software with uh, energy educators, um, and we can still track how many dollars we saved if we had not done anything in our energy program. These dollars that we save now, which amount to uh, 1.344 million, um, includes what we did with EEI, uh, energy educators, plus what we've been doing ourselves in the last few years as far as um, lighting upgrades and, and uh, um, other upgrades that we've done to try to be more efficient energy-wise. I guess uh, before I go into the next part, I'll, I'll ask if there's any questions on those two things. Any questions? Well, then I'll continue on. Thank you. 
high school boiler replacement. I like this picture. We really need a boiler that time of year. <laughs> um, um, but just to kind of bring you up to date, uh, we've ordered new boilers to replace a boiler we need to replace at the high school. The board approved of those purchases at the last meeting. Uh, the boilers actually are expected to arrive this week, is, is what I heard. The bids for the installation of the bo boilers were taken last week, and here are the results. These are the, the uh, three best bids we got on it. Um, in your packet, you we actually received six bids. Um, I, I, these bids are pretty favorable, uh, pretty close, so we, we know we're getting a, um, a good deal from them. Johnson Control is the low bidder on this one. I, I'm, uh, um, we actually purchased the boilers and equipment from Johnson, so from my perspective, it makes it really nice <coughs> because now the warranty issues and such, I'm not going to have to deal with the installer versus the person who bought it from, so it's really favorable. So. I'm going to be recommending tonight that we uh, accept Johnson Control's bid to uh, to install these components, and that's it. Unless you got any other questions. Any other questions or comments related to John's report? Just again, thank you for all the work you do to keep our costs under control and to make sure our students have a wonderful environment. Well, we try. It, it's it's not perfect all the time but we do try thank you thank you John thanks John okay the next item is transportation report mr. Saxton <coughs> This will be my first experience opening this, so I will myself live. <laughs> is this the 2010 platform? Is that what this is? I knew how to do it all along. I only wanted to see Mr. Clark get out of his chair. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. I was just reflecting while I was sitting there. I can't remember how many years I've been following John Daly in this report, <laughs> but I know this is my 15th year, and I have never caught up and surpassed John Daly. <laughs> so uh, maybe in the future I can do that. I do want to talk to you tonight about uh, transportation and briefly cover some similar information to what John had that was in our annual report. Uh, we do believe we are part of the school district uh, solution to educating every student to achieve global success. I've been hearing a lot of talk about social media and uh, I've been thinking, gee, the school bus and the vans that we run have been uh, giving us experience with social encounters for quite a while. So it's <laughs> nothing new to transportation. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight were identified by our community several years ago as to what they would like to see in transportation, uh, safety, quality, <coughs> nurturing environment, and value. <coughs> and the respective measures are included alongside there. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is safety. We recently started tracking uh, safety and accidents for 100,000 miles. Uh, we have a goal of having less than one accident per 100,000 miles, and these are the results that we have compiled so far. As you can see, the trend is downward uh, in reducing the number of accidents that we have. An accident is an event uh, that involves over $1,000 of property damage, uh, personal injury, or more than $200 of government property damage, excluding vehicles. Uh, that closely uh, correlates to Wisconsin accident reporting standards. It also covers only preventable accidents. When someone else hits us, it's not included in this. Uh, preventability is our responsibility, and we don't uh, use our own standards. We use uh, standards that have been developed by the Pupil Transportation Safety Institute whenever we investigate accidents, and that's how we come up with this information. <coughs> Ridership. Uh, recently on television, I was watching those, uh, it's either Dodge Vans or Chrysler commercials, where they say the true test of ownership is whether you come back uh, to purchase another vehicle. And that's what ridership is somewhat like. 
Are you coming back to continue riding school transportation? Uh, if you look at these numbers, Holman has consistently had high ridership. Part of that is due to what John alluded to, which is the location of our schools versus where our population is. Uh, other communities may have more sidewalks. Uh, they may have a culture uh, that encourages or is part of the community that has more walkers than Holman has. But historically, Holman has always transported a lot of students. And as you can see, we are the darker line at the top, approximately in 2000. 11-12, 73% of our students uh, were riding school transportation. And that does not include special education students. It does not include summer school. It's only regular riders. Uh, and then they use the third Friday count in September to come up with those percentages. The MVC average, which is below at 48%, uh, is fairly consistent. Now, I noticed that both of these lines have a slightly downward trend in them. And that's something uh, that we are paying attention to. We're not sure if that's a cultural trend. There seems to be a change in uh, how some of our new parents are perceiving transportation and how they want to bring their children to school. I don't know if it's an economic trend due to people having the opportunity to bring their children to school or what the true answer is. I can tell you that uh, we watch our transportation ridership fairly closely. Uh, we actually take monthly counts on every school bus as to how many riders there are and we compare that to what we would find desirable. Uh, already this uh, year we added a uh, middle school, high school afternoon bus route in order to alleviate what we perceived as overcrowding from our previous counts. And uh, for some of the students on the same level in the morning, uh, we went out and adjusted uh, four different bus routes so that we could even out the bus loads and have a better ride to school. Uh, I believe if you follow that testimony about uh, do they return for another ride, uh, it's fairly stable with a slightly downward trend. Average ride time. Part of a nurturing environment is the amount of time that students spend on school transportation. Uh, this is a new measure for us. This includes all students, and not only the students from inside the district, but the students that travel outside the district. Uh, many people, when they think of home and school transportation, uh, they forget that we also transport students outside our district, some to special education programs, uh, others to private schools that are beyond our borders. Uh, if you look at this and you want to read it going across, 21.88% uh, ride less than average, less than nine minutes on their ride time, 33% uh, average less than 20 minutes, and I can tell you the average for uh, all of our students coming to and from school uh, inside the district, the average for all students is actually 20 minutes. As you go across, you can see the numbers decrease, but they do go on quite a ways. When you get way over to the far right of the scale, uh, you'll notice way up to 90 minutes. Well, who rides 90 minutes? And the 90 minute rider happens to be a high school student uh, who attends a program outside our school district, in fact, a private school student. The longest ride time uh, for a Holman student in the morning was 51 minutes, and that was a high school student. The longest ride time in the afternoon was 65 minutes, and that was a middle school student. Uh, cumulatively, I think we're doing a good job on ride time. Remember, it's a balance between filling the bus and the length of the ride. Sometimes to fill the bus, you have to lengthen the ride, or conversely, uh, they don't follow hand in hand. They're opposing forces. That all does contribute, though, to the cost per pupil mile. Again, the MVC schools are in the uh, pink line. Uh, the Holman School District is the dark line. As you can see, we've had a consistently lower cost per pupil mile. And the pupil mile ratio is a measure that takes into account the distance that students live from school uh, in addition to the number of students that you transport. 
and this is taken from DPI data. <coughs> this is really, uh, it's kind of good news that we're maintaining uh, a lower cost than other, uh, the average of other MVC schools, but it really is uh, foretelling uh, of potential danger coming up. As you can see that uh, they're fairly stable in going straight across, we're starting to fall. And that is due to the fact that we did not replace school buses uh, as planned in previous years. And so it's kind of a false uh, economy. I'd be better off if our line was straighter and we were maintaining that gap between uh, the other MV schools, MVC schools, but not seeing it widen. Roger, does that include um, contracted for the MVC average yes, contracted yes. bus? Yes, includes and both contracted and uh, district owned okay. uh, fleets as you compare those costs. Thank you. And I know I see, I get the transportation magazines, you get the school board magazines, and I know they're always touting. Uh, how many dollars that uh, contracted services will save the school district. And the truth of the matter is you really need to put it to the test. Uh, I believe it's true. Any properly managed organization will look good up against one that's not effectively managed. Uh, but there are consistent savings here uh, that we have found and continue to see in the future. Our trend, uh, which you were just talking about, and we do have a lower cost than the MVC average, which includes contracted districts and other similar districts. Our future trend, we would expect increased cost. Uh, if anyone believes that fuel is going to go down to $3, I'd love to see it happen. Uh, I think the fuel cost is going to remain high as we go forward. Uh, we do show value for the dollars that are invested. In fact, the value that we show by having a lower cost mm -hmm. is that the savings in transportation can be redirected to the student needs in the school district, wherever they are. Uh, we are the best of the MVC comparables, but as I mentioned a second ago, there is danger ahead. And that danger shows up here. There's a red line on this scale that is the uh, uh, desired average age of our fleet. Uh, we made an adjustment in 2009-10, uh, which really is based on national statistics. Uh, everyone adjusted due to the economic uh, situation that they were finding themselves in. But what you'll see there coming up on January 1, 2013, the average age of our fleet, the gap is growing uh, each year. And while this does take into account the uh, replacement that I'll talk to you about in a moment of two buses due to the additional funding that was given transportation. Uh, it's not enough to overcome uh, the downward spiral that we've been in in terms of our fleet age. If you look forward as to the uh, line going across out to 2018, uh, this line is adjusted each year. The it makes a plan that we would replace uh, three buses each year consistently, which really was the plan that was started back in 2010 and 2011 that we would have liked to have seen flow across there uh, and maintain the age of our fleet. Uh, for vehicles this year, uh, we are go you're going to see bids for up to two school buses. Uh, we're going to apply for a grant. There's a national grant out uh, to help uh, replace older school buses. Uh, and quite honestly, we actually have a good chance at a grant and a poor chance at a grant. It's about like the Powerball lottery, but there are no uh, real measures except apply. So we're going to apply and uh, see if we can win the lottery to get some additional funding from the national level to replace buses. Uh, even if we don't get uh, those grants, uh, we're working to replace at least one or more buses this year. It may be similar to last year uh, where we purchased a bus that was a few years old because our goal is to improve the fleet and we will use whatever measures are necessary to do so. 
Uh, we will be purchasing uh, an additional van, or excuse me, a replacement van, uh, hopefully before the January 1 uh, deadline for us on that. It's an older van that we need to replace. And then we'll be watching the budget to see if we can purchase a second van before the end of the school year. <clears throat> on the horizon, these are things we're watching. Wheelchair needs. Our elementary programs have seen an increase in the number of students uh, that need wheelchair assistance, so that's something we're watching as far as our fleet. We're also watching the <coughs> alternative program needs. Uh, many students down there have unique schedules, which lends themselves to the use of vans uh, for transportation, and uh, we're watching that for an increase. And finally, I just heard the real estate uh, comments tonight on the news as I was waiting to come to the school board meeting about the fact that real estate uh, is slowly starting to pick up again, and we'll be watching to see if there's some growth in the school district. And finally, we'll be working on vehicle replacement. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to attempt to answer them. Any questions? Thank you, Roger. No questions. Okay, then next item on the agenda is building report card report. As Wendy gets settled, the, um, I believe we did put a paper copy. This has continued to be in development here, and so I believe we put a paper copy of what the rest of you will see on the screen as well. Good evening. I found this title and just thought it was an appropriate one because really it is up to us to use this data. The report cards were released this morning and they are the preliminary report cards. They are not the final report cards yet. Um, but they provide us with valuable information for parents, educators, and the information is really a foundation on ways that we can improve our schools. Tony Evers encourages us to look beyond the score or the rating because there is a wealth of information that goes into creating that actual score or rating. But I know this is what most people will look at. So for those of you in the audience, these are our school's overall scores. Again, I encourage you to visit our school web pages and the DPI website to get a picture of how well we are doing. What's new with these scores? They are based on multiple data points over multiple years. And the data points are based on the four priority areas, with the first one being student achievement. And that's how students on average are doing in reading and math over the past three years. The second priority area is student growth. Did students meet expected growth targets on the WKCE, or did they decline? Mm -hmm. The third priority area is closing gaps. Did our subgroups close gaps with white or non-labeled students? And the fourth priority area is on track for post-secondary readiness. And in this area, there are different measures used depending on the level of the school. So it could be attendance or graduation rate, third grade reading, eighth grade math, or ACT participation. So again, a lot of information goes into this overall accountability score, and it is important to look closer at the report cards to determine where are opportunities for us to improve. So this has been a process. Our administrative team and our coordinator team together worked on a communication process so that our administrators, staff, parents, community, and students would be aware of the changes that are reflected in the report card. You'll notice a plethora of dates that the administrative team met starting last February when the, the No Child Left Behind waiver was being written and our meetings <coughs> went from what is the waiver to what will be on the report card, the many changes of the school report card, and the release of the report cards and, and starting to analyze building data to determine where are possible areas for improvement. 
We've also, through emails and updates, shared with each other what we've learned. And a number of administrators went to CISA 4 for a meeting in August. And Dr. Carlson and I went in September. This information was also shared with our teachers and other staff during staff meetings. When the No Child Left Behind waiver was being written, some of the most of the buildings shared the preliminary report cards with their staff at that time. Updates have been through staff emails, and this was a huge part of the back to school in service so that our staff would understand the information that was going to be included on the report card. The next piece, our continuous improvement teams within our building have a large role now to lead their building in analysis and deeper understanding of each of the priorities areas of the report card. So for our parent and family stakeholder groups this morning, an e-blast was sent out to all of the parents in our district. The Visions newsletter in August was focused on what is a No Child Left Behind waiver, and in October was a closer look at the report card. Resources for parents were put on each building's web page with a copy of the link to the report card. There was also a video that is on each building's web page, and I will tell you that I'm not going for any acting lessons. I should be going for acting lessons. But I just want to show you real quick, each of the buildings. Wendy, can you pull a little closer to the microphone? Please? Sure. So this is what each of the building's web pages look like. The, the top are just parent guides, information from DPI related to the school report cards. The middle section is a a video of Tony Evers talking about his agenda 2017. Um, and the next link is a link of me going step by step through the report card, what day it is in each portion of the report card. And the bottom link will then take you right to the school report card. So February, March will be another very important time for us because as I've reported to you before, the, the cut scores for the WKCE have become more rigorous. So we will need to communicate with parents what that will mean. Uh, you, just a reminder, reading, they did change very drastically. A child could have been in the advanced rate and now will be considered basic. So. It's going to be something that we're going to have to stay ahead of and communicate with parents so that they're aware that their students' performance didn't necessarily decrease, our standards increased. With our community, um, our school board meetings are a great time when we can share that information because they are televised. Again, the Visions newsletter that goes to all of our community focused on the No Child Left Behind waiver and the school report cards. And I know Dr. Carlson checked the papers today, so there is information also in the local papers. And our last stakeholder group that we will need to continue to communicate with our students, especially at the middle school and high school level. The high school in August had a parent orientation where they broke off all the ninth grade students with their parents in three groups to talk about the changes and the cut scores and the school report cards coming out. And then as we get closer to the scores, their WKCE scores being released, we'll need to work with students on what do these new scores mean. Now is the important and impactful work as we begin to work with our continuous improvement teams in our buildings and our teachers to use the data from the school report card and other assessment data that we have used in the past to guide us in the creation of our SMART goals and the strategies to achieve our goals so that we are educating every student to achieve global success. 
questions. So are there any questions? I know that you do have information, and it's Dr. Carlson said in your packet on each building, um, what their rankings were, how they came to those numbers. I would add that Kate and I and Dr. Carlson attended a meeting last Thursday um, with CISA about this, and it, um, a lot of it is related to the No Child Left Behind, and that what was done years ago in setting the levels for what was proficient um, and what is the top and the advanced. advanced thank you advanced and proficient and that statewide those numbers had been set at a lower threshold mm -hmm. and so now what we're seeing and I think we've heard about this before the NAEP is that the mm -hmm. the NAEP um, standards are much higher and so our students may be performing or they are these are the tests these are the tests the WKCE tests we received a couple months ago but just re um, applied to the new NAEP standards and so the student who scored what they scored on the test that didn't change but where it falls as far as proficient or advanced or just meeting the, the minimum expectations did. And so that is going to be a huge conversation to have with parents and help them understand until we have a few years under our belt um, and the community. And the, the one positive thing is that it <coughs> is statewide and so um, area school districts saw the same things happen. Although it did appear to me in a couple places, as I remember, and I did not have a chance to, to go out and review, but it seemed that in some of our results previously, we were actually at or above the state um, standards or levels, and now it appears that we're below them in a couple areas. And I don't know if that statistically could have happened, um, and maybe that was just my first review. If You've heard of anything? You know, that could be, that? Um, Cheryl, because before we were only given the student achievement score, and now we're giving it in all the four areas plus okay. the benchmarks. So those are new areas that we weren't measured on before. Okay. So any questions? Uh, just a, a comment. And as, as I know, the, the whole formula has changed one of the things that I always where, where I work we look at when things change is you know everybody has the same change and so how do we compare and how do we rank compared to the other schools I think is important because we can talk about all the reasons why they dropped but everybody else has that same ball game so where do we rank I think is also important to look at and not just look at well everybody's dropped but you know, if we drop more than them or all of a sudden everybody drops and we're lower in that ranking or below the state average, I think that's something we have to look at as well. And I believe you have that handout in your folder, correct? Yeah, I do. I just I looked at it real quickly, and it, it doesn't look like we rank very well compared to some of the other MBC schools. I'm looking at middle school, we're fourth out of the seven, and high school, we're fifth out of the sixth. So, And there's too many elementaries. I couldn't do the math that quick up here, but our elementaries look really good. Uh, or, with the exceeds expectations yeah, it's just I a, did do that same math and yeah. you know that's the same thing that we noticed mm -hmm. when they were released in February yeah. and where we ranked I mean it's very very similar and we know areas that we definitely need to work on mm -hmm. and I think a key point to make in that they made at the conference was that you know <clears throat> now we're beginning now there are no um, explanations going forward that these are the standards we're looking at and that the primary focus should be within that these are the standards of things that we can control as a school district so um, I know some school districts probably did much better we saw the ACT well it you know our ACT numbers were were much lower as far as participation so now we know that and that is going to be something that we will be able to respond to or work to or as some people say teach to the test we're mm -hmm. just I hope that's not what we get into but I do believe that we need to look internally at looking for improvement percentages of improvement that we see each year and that's what we're really going to be tasked with doing 
I know with, with working with the building principals, a lot of the principals notice that closing the gaps is an area that if we really worked in that area, we would make mm -hmm. a significant impact on our overall score. So that is something I know from meeting with them that a number of principals are looking at with their continuous improvement plans that you will see next meeting. So. And some of our goals for our district are tied to these, correct? Definitely. So as we said, 17%, was it, in five years, or was it? 15, 15 I believe. 15 <laughs> points in five years or something, I think, is what we looked at for the improvement. So, you know, this is the, the beginning. The beginning of those kind of things. So any other questions or comments? I think, too, we'll be continuing to discuss how this impacts other areas within the district and um, performance, and not just of the schools this year, but next year the report will come out for the district. So it will be a combined report for the <coughs> district. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So then, original budget proposal, Mr. Austin. And as Jason gets settled as well, uh, we've been working. You had received back in your board packet on Wednesday uh, a, uh, a version of the original budget that's being proposed. There are some adjustments to that. And so for that reason, and Jason will have those reflected in what he shows everybody in the room and at home, but also the board has been provided a paper copy, I think a stapled copy that has the DPI format as well as our own uh, budget memo. So that should be in your packet as well. Thank you. Okay, tonight I come before you to present the original budget for adoption tonight. This is much, uh, it's very similar to our proposed budget that we presented in August with some minor updates. Um, updates from the tax levy, updates for our general aid or equalized aid, which we recently uh, received confirmation from DPI in, and then some last minute tweaks to the salaries and benefits area and, and other areas that I'll, I'll go through a little bit tonight. So um, I know, however, we, are, we will be competing tonight with the pre presidential debate, which starts in about seven minutes here. So I know our viewership's probably gonna go down, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, I believe this is uh, a good budget that I'm presenting tonight, uh, and hopefully we'll present um, additional monies that are available. And so lots of good news tonight with this original budget. Um, this is a format that you've seen many times in the past. Uh, remember we started off with a preliminary budget back in April. We presented a update to that, a proposed budget in early August um, with a final approval of that proposed budget in August. Now we need to present the original budget for adoption as per DPI and state statutes. So the budget format that you see tonight, uh, the general fund is the first section, uh, audited annual 2010-11, followed by the 2011-12, 2012-13 proposed budget, which is now going to be, become the original budget which is presented in the last column, column E. Just a few things that I'm gonna highlight very briefly. Line 10, our local taxes. If you notice the two highlighted cells here on line 10 in column C and column E, there's a fairly uh, substantial <coughs> increase, which may be alarming to some, but I'll get uh, elaborate that a little bit further tonight in the tax levy presentation. But I just wanted to call your attention to the general fund portion of the levy will be going up. I wanted to also bring your attention to line 32, which is also in the revenue category. There's a slight decrease or increase in our general fund, equalized eight at this point in time. Uh, 26.2 million is where we were last year. It is going up to 36.3 million. And that's rather surprising because we actually had a pretty significant reduction in shared cost over the prior year. But it's at, we were originally anticipating a, a reduction down to 25.9 million. But our final 
aid that was shared with us through DPI is 26.36 million. So pretty favorable given the fact that our shared cost was down last year and, and we knew much of that shared cost was going to be down with the deduction reduction for the WRS contributions for employees. Uh, we no longer had that last year, so that reduced our shared cost. Um, various other things, cost saving measures that we did have in the district reduced that shared cost. But all in all, year over year, we're increasing our equalized aid. So that's a little bit uh, more than anticipated. That's a very positive thing at this point. <coughs> Only two other items that I want to touch on. We jump down to the general fund expenditures category in this section here. The regular curriculum, this is where we budget for most of our uh, staff salaries and benefits in the instructional area. There's a slight increase there, uh, primarily due to uh, a new position that we will be presenting tonight. Um, amongst uh, some other things, salaries and benefits, slight increases in, in benefits. Uh, WRS uh, released their anticipated number for January. The employer and employee share is going from 5.9% up to 6.65%. Uh, it's something that we weren't forecasting. It's a pretty substantial increase. That increase in employee and employer share, the employer share shows right up here on, an, on these line items as a new cost to the district. The other category, line 71, central services, You'll notice there's a, a fairly substantial increase here. Um, remember, we did a one-time allocation to technology back in August. This, we, with the budget memo, the, uh, the additional detail in the budget memo, there's additional monies flowing to technology to help support infrastructure in the district, wireless technology, and so on and so forth. <coughs> this is where it would show up in the uh, budget that is presented tonight. So. Any questions on any of those changes, both on the revenue side or the expenditure side? There were no other material changes uh, from the August proposed budget that were presented in the original budget. So looking tonight to, for your approval and adoption of the original budget. And that's what the motion would be, correct? To adopt the original budget as pre presented? That would be correct, yes. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, then tax levy certification. Did you want to make a yeah, comment? Yeah, I was going to make a comment. I was just kind of looking at Jason to see if he was. You also saw attached, um, and I don't know, Jason, if you have that, but the budget memo that we call it, it's it's more of a detailed look at uh, Jason has revenues and sources and then um, uh, we get into the expenditures and he lists discontinued expenses as well I put a, uh, a revised copy in your folder tonight and it shows um, and Jason I don't know if you oh we have it up there not on the screen in front here though um, and so this is an update from August when you were presented. And so, so it gives you a little bit more detail of um, allocations and recommendations to allocate those dollars. And I just wanted to note a couple differences there that um, within the expenditures and uses, we have gone ahead and I am recommending that we um, Go ahead and look at some areas that back in August, we, or even July, we were still planning on some contingency funds. You may remember the 2.0 FTE Elementary, as well as some unmet, unmet needs um, that I said at that time. Hopefully we're able to keep that, maintain it, and repurpose or reallocate it. Well, I believe we are at this point. Uh, as Jason has shared, we've had, I think, some good news overall. And so those one-time program allocations that were recommended back in July totaling about $600,000.
If you look under that category on program allocations, you'll see one major change under the area of information technology. Previously, you had, we had allocated an additional $225,000 there. You'll see tonight that I'm suggesting we go ahead and um, re redirect some of those other areas and add a total of $325,000 to that. Jan and I will talk more during my report uh, more specifically about that. And, um, but I just wanted to make note of that at this point. And um, those were the major changes there. And if you had any questions, again, uh, specific to the information technology, Jan and I will be talking more about that. And that will be uh, before this appears on the consent agenda. So it gives you an opportunity to ask questions or make a decision. Okay, thank you. Then the tax levy certification, Mr. Austin. Okay, part of the budget process is to present the, for approval the final certification of the tax levy. Uh, remember, at the annual report, uh, it was presented to the, the board and approved by the community members present that the board have the full authority to establish the tax levy up to the full amount allowed. We didn't set the levy at that point in time, but the community members present gave the authority to the board to levy up to the full amount allowed. So at this point in time, tonight we actually set the levy and move forward from there and in incorporate any of those changes into the budget into that original budget as presented so the tax levy is the output of the revenue limit formula I've talked a little bit about the revenue formula in the past but this affects the general fund and it's primarily affected by three things the membership average the maximum revenue per member and the general aid uh, confirmed by DPI. The output then becomes the allowable levy that we're able to levy as a local tax entity. So the membership average, the current third Friday count, and the two fiscal years preceding that create the average of the three years. In July, we are anticipating a three-year average of about 3,789 FTEs. And this is different than head count that is done on third Friday count, third Friday. This is the FTE, the conversion of what the cost for those students. In October, we realized 3,802. So the average ended up being 13 students higher. So that's a good thing. So the FTE was a little bit higher than anticipated, driving our membership average up, which is good. The number. The second thing, the maximum revenue per member. Remember in the past, uh, last year even, this maximum revenue per member was actually decreased. In 2010, 2010, 2010, 11, that amount actually increased by $200 each year. Last year, it decreased by $576. So we had a pretty significant decrease last year. Well, this year, it's going to be increased by $50. And we knew that a while back, but that's a key piece in the revenue limit formula. So we learned what the membership average is recently with that third Friday count. The maximum revenue per member is increased by $50. And the final piece, the general aid, the equalized aid portion, is shared with the district on October 15th on an annual basis. And like I said before, um, that number was actually a little bit higher than we were anticipating. We were anticipating a decrease down to 25.9 million. But at this point in time, we are expecting 26.2 million of additional aid. So uh, a little bit higher than what we were anticipating, which is a good thing as well. So what does that do to the allowable levy? I think Mr. Clark will enjoy this. We, we've talked a lot about the buckets in the past. Okay, what are those buckets? Well, 
<laughs> you know, in a picture here, try to explain the buckets. So the revenue limit formula based on those three key factors creates the amount of money, the size of the bucket that we have to work with. So last year we had a $37.3 million bucket. That's how big we had to operate off of last year. This year, our bucket is going to 38158000 So that's primarily because higher enrollment, greater FTEs as a result of that, the $50 per membership increase, and our aid then is also increasing. How does the aid impact it? Well, if you see the blue section in that bucket, that's the, the, the bottom portion of that, the blue portion, is the equalizer general aid, and that's going to increase by about 119,000. So a slight increase in the bottom portion of that bucket. The top portion within the revenue limit formula, it's the revenue limit minus that equalized aid equals the amount we can levy for. Well, if you take a larger number in the revenue limit minus a little bit larger number in the equalized aid, we get a larger tax levy that we're able to levy for. So if you see there, that portion of the bucket is going up by approximately $700,000. What does that mean to the local taxpayers? Well, the tax levy at this point in time, the one that is presented tonight, looking for your approval on, is anticipated to increase $371,000. But in that previous slide, you'd say, well, gosh, I thought it was going to go up $700,000. Well, that portion is what is for the general levy only. So we got to drill a little bit deeper. Our revenue limit increased by $837,000. We have to reduce the state aid out of there. That is going to increase $119,000. The output, then, is the taxes that we can generate per the revenue limit. However, our referendum approved debt that we've presented in the past and we've had approved in the past, that is actually decreasing year over year by $353,124. So because that is decreasing, our net tax levy increase is $371,000. So because the money we need in the debt service fund is less year over year, we don't have to levy as much this year. So it partially offsets that larger increase on the general fund side. <coughs> Any questions on that so far? So year over year, the tax levy changed. The amount in 2012 is anticipated to be 14,931,189. The amount in 2011 was 14,559,710 for a total increase of 371,000, or 2.25% increase. Take a quick look at our three-year history. Everybody always asks, well, what is this off of last year? What about the prior year? Well, if you look back into 2010-11, we just came off a 9% increase in the tax levy at that point in time from the prior year. So which would have been 9-10. We had a slight decrease last year and a slight increase this year. But the, school, the total school levy is, is about right in line where we were two years ago. So the final proposed mill rate is $11.40. Now remember, the proposed rate that we discussed at the annual meeting in the budget hearing was 1150. So the rate is actually going down a little bit. So how does that rate impact the community? Well, 2011, we had an $11.23 mill rate. This year, we're setting the levy at $11.40. You can see the difference there at $100,000 value in property, 150 and 200,000. So slight increases on any of those property values. One thing to keep in mind, how does this impact our target measures? Remember this is the gross school tax rate 
that was set by the Finance Committee and approved by the Board. So 1140 is a slight increase to the 1123, but it's still within our target measures. Our upper limit is $11.54, so we're about 14 cents below that. Our lower limit is 1044. So we're in the upper end of the range, but still lower than one of our, our top end of the target. So keeping that in mind, also the tax base growth, keeping our, our pulse on that. The tax base, we were anticipating a $1.319 billion tax base. We came in at 1309, so about nine billion dollars lower, or nine million dollars lower, excuse me, than what we were projecting in August. So a slight decrease, but still a year-over-year -year growth in the valuation within the district. Um, some municipalities were slightly down. Uh, a few of the other ones were just slightly up. So slight increase there, about a 1% growth year-over-year -year in the equalized valuation. Any questions? Any questions? So then the motion for the board will be to set the tax levy at that dollar amount, or is it the mill rate we're, texting, we're setting tonight? I could go down to the position rate. That's okay. So we're setting it the total tax levy at 14931189 which equates to a mill rate of 1140 but we're setting it based on the dollar value as presented in the certificates and whatnot that the board clerk needs to approve and sign tonight. So. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Then the next item is reading resource position. Dale and Wendy. I'm going to go ahead and invite Wendy up and... Um, do you have a issue paper about a recommendation to add a 0.5 FTE reading resource position? This is also itemized in that budget memo that you have also for this evening. And I'm just going to let Wendy not necessarily repeat uh, the issue paper, but just to highlight um, the need for this position and why now and um, why not previously and why not later thank you so it, this is in the issue paper but it, last year our title funds went down so when a position was open we only filled it at a 0.5 FTE to live within our means this year again we had another title opening <laughs> and we again filled it at 0.5 or you know the 0.5 because of the title funds going down. But as a result of that, we have a lot of unmet struggling readers' needs throughout the district. And with the focus <coughs> with the No Child Left Behind waiver and also with their own strategic goals on student learning, thought that this position is really important because research shows if kids are struggling and they're not reading at grade level by the end of third grade, their chances of catching up are only 25%. So our title program, our reading resource program, really focuses on our K-2 students. And this year, the needs of our students across the district, and even last year, we didn't have enough reading teachers to cover all the needs. So that is why it's so before you. Again, to recap, our title funding has been reduced. Yes. Our needs have not been reduced um, and uh, so this is something that we feel is important at this time and uh, again more specific to the funding um, this was on paper actually taken out redirected from such things as those that 2.0 FTE contingency dollars at the elementary level this will be again I'm sorry if you mentioned it Wendy but at the elementary level at the correct? elementary okay. K2 and so this is included in the consent agenda tonight. If I, I put it in there, just um, if you're comfortable and ready to go with it, we would appreciate that. If, if not, we certainly understand. 
But uh, of course, um, this is something we thought we could um, get the year started and, and see what happens. And uh, now we, we feel this is the right thing to do. And so we're anxious to get it going. Yes. Any questions? Um, when, when are you looking for this person to start? As soon as possible. I mean, we're already getting near the end of the first quarter. So as soon as you know you give okay we will start the posting and interviewing process and we'll see what we get the timing of this isn't ideal either but we we want to give it a try anyway okay. any other questions okay thank you Wendy then moving on employee handbook clarification out of classification Dale and Melissa I am going to ask Melissa, to just just to clarify the clarification um, quickly on this one. Again, this is as we have moved, continued to move forward with um, the, the handbook. It's been brought to our attention a variety of things that we have brought to your attention, and so this is an additional piece. So, um, as we begin to interpret the language in the handbook, we have found um, with the payroll department that the interpretation of this language was not consistent. Um, the, there was no intended change um, when this language was drafted. It was meant to um, be applied to employees who are asked by their supervisor to substitute in a different position other than the one they may be their regular position. Um, the um, language was being interpreted as anyone who may pick up additional substitute work in the district. So um, it we found that we needed to add that interpretation in there to identify that it is only when a supervisor directs an employee to move or perform work in a different position other than their own so they're not losing any compensation so this is intended to reflect our practice that we have had in the past correct any questions okay thank you melissa and so most of these items will we will be included in the consent agenda, which we will get to in a few minutes. Moving on to board member reports and discussions, I'll call on board members in the order of the roll call and ask for you to present any comments or committee reports. Um, Brianna. Well, first of all, I would like to start out by um, talking about how proud I am of my school. This past uh, couple weeks, we had put on a fundraiser for a cancer patient down in the Milwaukee area, and her dream was to meet Justin Bieber, so we put together a video, and we held a Miracle Minute fundraiser, and she actually did get to meet him this weekend, so it was very exciting. Um, also, um, the students did a great job at the football game. Clay was this weekend as well. Um, overall, we've been doing a great job. Uh, we had the Young Women's Empowerment Group uh, Love Your Body Day campaign this past week, and I had sent out the video this weekend to the administrators. Um, and uh, we also put up posters around the high school. Um, they're pretty neat. They, uh, they're a coloring book kind of poster, and then um, it has they're really interesting. You'll just have to see them. <laughs> I can't describe them. But um, also, I will be getting out the questionnaire to the board finally some, sometime this week um, for the student new newsletter. And I also wanted to end that if you haven't opened your mailbox or if you haven't turned on a TV, I do have to tell you it is an election season. So get out and vote. It is a huge election, and there's a lot at stake. So. Um, Make sure that you get to the polls on November 6th. Thank you, Brianna. Um, Mrs. Treadway. Sure. Um, the Building and Grounds Committee met this evening before our board meeting. We want to welcome our new member, Lloyd Drazen, who will start with us in November. He's a community member that will join us. We reviewed two policies that we will be um, moving on for board approval, the criminal damage to school property, and the school facility planning policy. And we made a, an addition to um, one of those. The sustainable funding of facilities has been a topic we've been discussing and we'll be hopefully spending the whole meeting in November talking about that and hoping to bring some options to the board for what we can do for those funds that we have not had budgets for. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dunlap. 
I'd like to mention that we had a finance uh, committee meeting last Monday, <coughs> and there's a set of notes uh, from 917, my information packet, and um, we discussed uh, uh, lots of topics, and one, of course, was the budget for this uh, that we just finished. And I'd like to remind everyone that the increase in funding, um, the increase in, in revenue, uh, was more than eaten up by the <coughs> mandatory expenditures uh, again, plus 10 percent. So don't don't be uh, fooled into thinking that we have some extra money to spend <laughs> for, uh, for extracurricular activities, etc. But because uh, the increase was was eaten up, plus another 10 percent in the mandated. What I'm trying to say is that the gap continues to grow between the funding that we're getting and the funding needs that we have to maintain where we're at. Um, there's only a couple of choices there. Of course, one is to increase the revenue, revenue coming in or decrease the spending going out. So we've got some tough decisions to make next year. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gittins. I think Mr. Dunlap just covered most of my... Uh, activities, so I'll, I'll decline to talk any further. <laughs> okay, Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, I was uh, going to mention what Brianna had mentioned about Mr. Kowalski's class. I had read the paper article um, online on Thursday and was really, really proud and quick posted something to my daughter, Madison, because she had Mr. Kowalski. And of course, news travels so fast, she posted back, I know, Mom, I already <laughs> told everybody in the free world about it. So um, it was just really cool. And to think that that little girl actually met Justin Bieber, I just think that's the neatest thing and that the only kids had a big part to play in that just really, really made me proud. And I wanted to put a plug in for um, this Sunday at the American Legion in Holman. Um, if you're not doing anything, or even if you are doing something and want to rearrange your schedule, there's a benefit for Mike Hickey. Um, I know a lot of you know Lori Hickey, the secretary at the high school. <clears throat> um, it, it's a very, um, it's a kind of a sad story. Lori and Mike have a really deep faith. They have a very close-knit family. Um, I just got to know the Hickeys through track when our kids ran track together. And they're just a really, really great family who's had a really um, a rough time, but always see the positive and the spiritual and everything. And so I believe the benefit starts at noon. I'm going to start working some one of the games at noon, so I know that it, it will at least be started by noon. And if you want to come and play Clinko or Plinko or whatever <laughs> game that I'm going to be helping Carrie Shaw with, um, we can play that. But if you're if you're not busy, come on over and help because I know it would really help out the Hickeys. And man, we're a great community. And look at all the things we do. And um, they could they could really use your help and your prayers and your presence and just your emotional support. So come over to the Legion on Sunday, October 28th for the Mike Hickey benefit. It's a great cause. and It'll be a lot of fun. And give Lori and Mike and their girls a big hug. That's it. Thank you. This is Mayor. Um, Student Achievement and Learning Committee um, met October 15th. Um, I'm just going to be brief because we're very close to bringing five different documents to the board. Um, those include search and seizure, student attendance, graduation requirements, curriculum developments, and student scholarships. Those are the five that we're working on now. Um, and also just kudos to this committee. I, I've only I've only attended two of these, but the level of conversation I think our community would be proud of. I, I feel it's a very safe committee where every opinion can be brought forward in a, in a safe environment. And we had some lively discussions, didn't we, Brianna, um, that triggered all of us to think of sides we hadn't thought of before. So I really value that. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that when we do finish with the documents and the recommendations that um, Holman will be well served. They'll be as legal as they should be, but they'll also be a state of the art as they should be. Um, I want to piggyback and just um, congratulate Brianna. She and I talked at length um, a few days ago about the Young Woman's Empowerment um, project that she's working on, and and I think you know I, that's just one of many. I know you must know people who follow their passions, but Brianna's definitely someone who follows her passions and then becomes an activist for them, and I think you should be congratulated for that. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. Menninger. Just a couple quick things as well attended the Building Grounds Committee uh, earlier that uh, report was given on. And then uh, still fall sports going on. Get out and enjoy. Lots of good things. And uh, state cross country meet this weekend, of which I know uh, Holman has a representative <laughs> in that as well. So uh, plenty of uh, good things still going on uh, before the winter sports set in. Thank you. And it is a good time to be a home and Viking. I just am so proud of what I've seen these last few weeks. Initiatives like Brianna's um, really add to the um, power of the district. But then you have the DECA video with all that they did and the uh, tension that they got. And think about it, to suggest that home and Vikings wear purple on a Friday football game day, you know, that's kind of unheard of, but purple is Justin Bieber's favorite color, and I was told by a fellow former school board member you could never wear purple. I won't, you know, mention that it's a rival's color, color or anything, but I thought that was very cool, and then watching the news and the articulate young people that we had speaking on our behalf. And then to watch TV and see the ad about hiring people of all abilities. And I'm like watching this and it's all Holman people. I'm like, why is this a Holman ad? And then it was, it was a Holman you know, school district ad. And that was wonderful and made me very proud to see that. Um, of course, football and the other sports, cross country, those sports that are still going, um, those people, perform admirably and um, are wonderful assets for our district. And then I, as a grandma, I think I told you, my daughter began um, a couple weeks ago attending school at Viking. Granddaughter, sorry. <laughs> and um, Surprise. you know, an example of what happens is grandma, I'm the grandma, stopped to pick her up at daycare and she had forgotten her backpack on Friday at the school and so, I said, well, we'll go to the school and get it. She was so upset, and there's a custodian, and he met us at the door, and I hadn't come, I went in the wrong door. Lucy was upset with me that we were going in this door because this is the door. And he took us to the, you know, he took time out and took us to the place where her backpack was, and then helped us out. And that's just, it, it didn't matter if it was Viking Elementary or Prairie View or Evergreen, I know that that's what would have, how we would have been welcomed at the door, and that just, again solidifies that it not only it's the people in the classroom that make us a quality school but it's the people that make um, sure that we have a good clean place for our students to attend good meals they're transported um, safely every day when they come to school and they're assisted in the classroom as much as they need to be so it, it just again solidified for me and I think I'm going to see the district through new eyes um, <laughs> as a grandma so I just wanted to say thank you for um, all that you do for the district. So um, other items under board reports, um, there was some correspondence, as Gary mentioned, the finance committee notes were in your uh, packet. We also have upcoming board meeting November 12th, November 26th, December 10th, and then we are originally scheduled to have a meeting on December 24th which I think we are looking at rescheduling to December 17th. If you would just let Dr. Carlson know six or seven, if we wanna change the date, it is a Monday. Um, we also have some other committees scheduled for the 24th, so you may wanna take a look at your committee schedules to change those so that you may hold your meeting that month. Any questions on the schedule or those dates or comments? Okay. Then moving on to district administrator's report, Dr. Carlson. Well, in addition to the happenings reports, I always encourage you to take some time. That's, again, a great way to keep up on what's happening in our buildings. The focus tonight, we are going to take some time to provide everybody an update on technology. And uh, so while Jan makes her way, and I'll join her in a few minutes, there are a couple of other announcements or things I want to share with you. First of all, you may have noticed a new uh, person up here in front, uh, over, way over to my left, and uh, Christina <laughs> Kovacs. Wait till the camera gets on. <laughs> Christina Kovacs, we welcome Christina. Christina is uh, the, going to be the, oh. <laughs> uh, the uh, executive assistant to the district administrator. As we know, Lois Johnson is, uh, after 38 years, going to be um, moving on to the next phase, whatever that career may be, 
And so, um, so we are so pleased to uh, bring Christina on board. She has spent the day in the district today in the office working with Lois and will a couple days yet this week and then back at it next week. And so she's experiencing her first board meeting. So welcome, Christina. Also, um, again, uh, President Hancock had referenced earlier in the board meeting about the board outreach, and I want to thank both her and Kate Mayer for attending that. And I think it was a uh, Billy Finkel from on Alaska did a from CISA did a nice job of really summarizing in many ways much of the information that has come your way over over time. And so, um, as alluded to by Wendy and others, a lot a lot more to come. In the correspondence folder, I believe I included a flyer on the Badger Cooley power line, transmission power line, and um, we have reason to believe that issue may be circling back around and coming back at uh, the home and community, but we will keep you updated. I believe there is an, a public session in Onalaska, I want to say October, well, 23rd, which would be tomorrow. I believe, and I, but I don't have the location. We can get that um, out to people, but this is, uh, again, I don't have anything officially to share, but it's something we're gonna need to keep watch over very closely. Um, you may have noticed some of our uh, principals and staff came in uh, um, a little bit late. Uh, this is a busy time. We have parent-teacher conferences going on, and so I appreciate uh, those who still came in tonight after a uh, full day and then evening of parent-teacher conferences. Uh, American Education Week, that's on the consent agenda to approve proclamation for that. You may have noticed, it was brought to my attention, you, you may have noticed the attachment um, as part of your packet, the poster that we, um, that, uh, we included in there. It really talks about, uh, it actually mentions on the poster, references no school on Monday, November 12th, and we wanted to make sure that doesn't apply here. There is school on Monday, November 12th, and so, but that is a, a recognition of Veterans Day happens to tie into that week. So we do look forward to, again, recognizing everything, everything about our district and public education um, across our nation uh, during that week. Let's see, I think that's it. As I make my way over to Jan, she's going to get started. And again, this has been in the development um, just as the budget has been in the development. And so uh, you have quite a bit of paper tonight in your folder. And so I believe we included a paper copy, which again, the, um, everybody in the audience will see up on the screen. Good evening. Well, I don't think I've ever looked forward to a technology update as much as this one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it is a very important uh, and defining moment, I think, for our district to bring you this report. Uh, we're already a decade into the 21st century, and our students are in need of being prepared for an ever-changing learning environment and work world. It is time for us to really address their 21st century learning needs, and we, I hope that this presentation will help, help do that. We're going to be talking about the district wireless project update, and as you remember, in February of this past year, we did an audit, and in June, we presented a report giving you a bit of background on the results of that report. We're going to also give you a little bit of an update on the Bring Your Own Technology initiative and some recommendations that we have to expand that initiative. And even though we have not formally presented in the past on the one-to-one -one, uh, device option, we have been actively researching uh, the area school districts and uh, statewide districts have moved down the road of the one-on-one, -on -one, bringing anywhere, anytime access to their students and to their staff. So we want to talk about that as well. Um, yeah, as far as the wireless project update, 
our first priority is to update infrastructure. That's a very important piece of the work we are about to do. And the district allocated an initially uh, $225,000 towards this effort. And we've been actively working on um, getting updated prices for our controllers, which are the intelligence behind the wireless um, deployment device uh, management piece. Uh, we've been also working on getting updated switch prices and we're in the process of making sure that we have the kind of technology infrastructure that will guarantee security, reliability, redundancy. We can't have our controllers going down. Uh, educators and our students are going to depend on that wireless never to be down. That was what I suspect. And uh, we are busy about that business getting those firm prices in place. We're ready to purchase. The wireless project timeline has a phased in approach right now. We're in that process of getting those quotes on that very top level priority equipment. Uh, the middle school and the high school are our two very top priorities. Those are the students that are leaving our doors the earliest. We want them to have the advantage of learning in a wireless environment and having that kind of access. And so we're busy going about the business of uh, really addressing what it's going to take to make this happen within this school year and certainly by the start of next school year. Um, the elementary schools are also of a very high priority. We have a lot of elementary educators who are actively integrating iPads. They are actively wanting and seeking to use laptops. Their students in fourth and fifth grade have um, also uh, very, you know, very excited about engaged learning. So they are our next priority. The district investment that was mentioned tonight, giving us an additional $325,000 total of $550,000, will help us make that foundation and get it in place, and I hope relatively soon. I meet with wiring folks on Thursday. We plan to begin this process as fast as we can, as carefully as we can, to make sure that we have an optimal, um, capacity-rich environment and not just for today, tomorrow, or three years from now, but from 10 years from now, we must lay that foundation. We know that most districts are heading in a high density mobile learning environment. That means likely one-on-one -on -one or at least a very high level of access. And uh, this is a very important piece in terms of moving us forward, excuse me, moving us forward. Simultaneous to the work that we're doing right now on the infrastructure pieces, uh, the financial planning and prioritization must be in place. There will be no success in this project without staff development and without IT staffing to assure that the technical um, uh, underworkings stay consistently working and that our staff have the technology literacy skills that they need, the support that they need to move forward in a wireless learning environment. Right now, our presently our mobile device access, access is fairly limited. We have 4,000 students, nearly 4,000 students, I, rounding that off, <laughs> and we have 250 mobile <coughs> devices across the district. That spells a very, very low ratio, and we must bring that up. We must bring them access. Our high school has only 30 mobile devices accessible to 1,100 students. So this is an area that we really need to concentrate on and make a concerted effort to invest. Our elementaries are in the same boat, except for Prairie View. They have 60 devices. Evergreen has 30. So you can see we have a challenge. We have base level uh, classroom technology needs. In our high school, 50% or approximately do not have LCD projectors in their classrooms. We need to address the base level classroom technology needs of document cameras, mounted LCD projectors, the tools, digital tools for digital learning. You cannot teach without digital tools these days. They're critical. 
grant writing is going on right now. I'm very excited to say that. We had a team of educators from Sand Lake and from Prairie View and from across the district helping us craft a grant for $100,000, bringing in some funding that will need, will address part of our needs. I am really optimistic. We can write the most fantastic grant. I know that we have the people who have the amazing skills that they bring to the table. They worked hard. and. Uh, although some of them uh, are not in the room right now, all of the people in the room right now has, have contributed to the effort of trying to move our district forward, and I thank them for being here. Each one of them has a, a concerted interest in their representing their schools. We are also updating our district's mandated statewide INT plan. We had a good plan. 2008, we worked hard, 25 people invested a whole year of their efforts to bring that plan forward. It had a good foundation. We believe in that plan. We believe in embracing 21st century learning for all. We need to update it, and we need to move forward on it, and that's what we plan to do. On to the BYOT, um, the update. The but long and short of it, you can see the points on the screen. We didn't have enough time and enough uh, exposure across the district for our staff and our students. We want more opportunity to expand the pilot so that every teacher who has their own device and wishes to bring it can access wireless any, in any of our buildings. We want the high school to continue at the student level um, to test the concept of BYOT and bring forward their recommendations. Only seven students at the high school in late uh, April and May were able to participate. We think that we can do a better job. We just didn't have enough time. We met with principals and with Wendy, our instructional services director, and these are our recommendations, and you're seeing them up on the screen. We updated our staff recommendations. We want to go forward um, with Travis Kowalski continuing through this semester, bringing forth recommendations, and then expanding it Mr. Bear feels a little more comfortable if we could just continue it and get some more feedback and then craft that guidelines appropriately. And um, so that's our recommendations. And I'm going to let Dr. Carlson take over from here. OK. <laughs> I can continue. Um, again, <laughs> sorry, Papa here. Uh, higher, we um, definitely are looking at a higher level of wireless access. Um, d devices in the hands of our students and our staff. Our staff come first. They need to have those devices early on so that they can get the laptops or with the iPad device or whatever the device is and learn how to teach in this new, brave new world of wireless learning. So we want to provide that and provide the hands-on. We have been dealing with the an internet bandwidth all along. When I first came, we had three megs. Today, we have 100 megs of internet bandwidth. That is something to be proud of. We are doing a better job of making sure that we provide that kind of high level of internet access. And of course, the fundamental to all of this is the skills for our staff and our students. We cannot go forward and have success without making sure that we are aligned with our instructional goals. I've always been a person in my heart and in my head to support instruction driving technology. Technology is a tool. It is a piece. It's hardware. It's tools. It's resources. It is instruction that is the driving force here. So now I can hand it over. So you are hearing several different things this evening, uh, making our district have a wireless access throughout our district. Jan has presented recommendations on expanding a bring your own device pilot at the high school. And now I'm going to share with you um, how we continue to look at, which many of on the board and in the room and others have been discussing as well, what would it take for the district to provide a device for every student. So one of the things you have to start looking at is um, how on earth would we make that happen? And what's our priority as a school district when we start looking at grade levels and students 
And so Jan has talked about in a previous slide, middle school and high school. Um, and so that's what I want to just share a little bit with you and take a couple minutes. I would be uh, recommending to you that we continue to explore an implementation of a one-to-one -one device for every middle school and high school student. Um, I'll, in a few minutes, I'll go through some funding uh, possibilities. And, um, but first and foremost, uh, we need to have our wireless foundations in the district. And so that is why, again, I, on, your, on the budget, I outline and recommend increasing that allocation to IT of $550,000. So tonight, it, it would be our recommendation that as you approve the budget, you do so knowing that we would get to work, as Jan has talked about, in making sure that infrastructure begins to get in place by utilizing at this point up to $550,000. If you're not comfortable with that tonight, then you'll need to, I would ask you to go ahead and pull that out um, and we can have more discussion and come back later. But I put that in, much like we did last July, reallocating or allocating, redirecting some of those additional dollars. So I hope that that, if you have any questions on that, um, you need to be real clear on that, that, um, that additional money. We're going to get started, just as Jan talked about. Okay. So regarding uh, Jan has already covered, if you want to move on to a couple, we talked about middle and high school, the wireless infrastructure in place. Jan already talked about it's so critical that staff in an implementation like this, they would have the exposure first and time to work on their own training and uh, become, fami <coughs> become familiar with the devices. and. Not only the device itself, but how do you use it for instruction for student learning. Um, looking at a purchase, so on the, when we get to the next slide and talking about funding, uh, really looking at a purchase. And I had the opportunity to, um, as, as Jan has had, to explore some other districts. And we have a neighbor to our immediate east that uh, is in their first year of an implementation of 100% middle and high school. I believe Ms. Jacobsinski knows that district very well. <laughs> and, uh, so, but I did have an opportunity to uh, visit with Superintendent Gunderson and learned a great deal on how, on how do they make it happen, but also um, how is it going for them. And I, while I don't have all that information ready for tonight, um, I will be sharing that in the near future and reporting more specifics. So what you see on the slide is there's no question we would need to repurpose, uh, be very specific about directing dollars to this initiative. Uh, if you base a purchase over four years, if we were to finance, I'll use the word finance, a purchase over four years, you can see the range that we would be projecting. What this amounts to is approximately 2.5 to $3 million. So that is after, that goes beyond the infrastructure of making sure that we have that wireless foundation. These are just very um, approximate projections. And Jan and I, I think we reported earlier that we have had an opportunity to meet with representatives of, of a of particular vendor um, to begin exploring with that. Um, again, the training and, as Jan mentioned, the IT support would be critical to this, to go into it. And uh, there's no question that it needs to be centered around student learning and instruction. Um, I, don't, I think we would be setting ourselves up for failure if it was for anything else. So we look to uh, that commitment among all of us uh, not just the board, but staff and our community. And um, as, we, as we perhaps move forward with this venture. So the next steps we look at, I think uh, it's been talked about in a couple other presentations this evening about priorities. 
and we, we take a good look at our vision and mission. And, and you know, that is built on student learning and student achievement, growing our students, preparing our students for the future. Yes, um, technology, uh, we believe, will make a difference in preparing our students. Um, I think that uh, for those of us who look for technology to make a difference only in a student's learning in proficiency of reading and math, I would, I would suggest that there's more to it than that as we prepare our students to be prepared for um, after they leave us. So as we move forward, uh, we need to make sure that it, this would reflect the priorities that we have set and that it aligns with our vision and mission and the goals that we, our SMART goals and the goals that we have outlined. And then get about the business of making sure we have a fiscal sustainable plan to make it happen. I believe we can, we can do this. Um, it won't be easy. None of this is easy. But um, I believe we can do it. And I'm right now looking for board direction uh, to continue on this. I have some opportunities personally to attend some briefings for superintendents, some conferences to continue to learn more. And so looking for questions that you have of Jan and myself at this point. But that is an update of where we're at. Again, we're, we're looking forward to being able to move forward with first setting that foundation with uh, creating that greater access, uh, wireless access throughout the district. I'll leave it at that and give you a moment to ask questions and looking for that direction. So first, questions. Well, by creating board um, a greater amount of wireless, ac wireless access, do you mean that we'll be having a Wi-Fi, a district Wi-Fi program at all, or? Yes, that's what we mean. You would be able to go to any part of our buildings, any classroom, any multi-purpose room, theater, gym, and be wireless, would, would have access to wireless. Other questions? I noticed that you mentioned that uh, had uh, X number of wireless pieces of equipment. And I also know that the, I have some very old laptops and I put USB ports in and it became wireless uh, immediately. That there's, when you say they're wireless, you mean there's, there's ones that are hardwired or that are hardware wireless, and the, but there's also lots of equipment we can make wireless with USB adapters, correct? Uh, we have not investigated USB adapters. Uh, we need to have secure wireless access points throughout the building that cannot be prone to theft or loss or um, have issues with, with access. So in most deployments that I'm familiar with, it's always mounted access points. What I'm just saying is if, if you have a laptop like this one, you know, in our company, for example, uh, we put a wireless up on the ceiling in our, in our office, and we bought the white the wireless USB ports, plug them in, and then our laptops were wireless, and we could go get uh, wireless connections or anything that was, uh, any Wi-Fi connection out there, if you want to go to McDonald's or wherever you can hook up. It's relatively inexpensive. It's like you know, less than $20 for USB adapters and the software to go with. Well, we'll certainly look into it. Oh, mm -hmm. it it's mm -hmm. really easy. It's just plug and play. <coughs> Other questions? The timeline if we approve this evening the additional funding are you looking at doing that yet this year for the wireless access efforts? as fast as possible to be honest with you I would like to see the high school get wired get the switches uh, replaced 80% of our network switches are about 11 years old and are not capable of supporting a, a wireless environment so um, Matt and I have talked about what does that look like what would be the scenario it would be a lot of effort. Um, it requires more uh, assistance from uh, either outside or getting temporary help in. But um, it is very important, I think, that we move forward as quickly as possible. And then the yes, this is a piece that we would like to have done this year. Okay. And then the timeline for the other um, parts of the proposals that you're looking at, like the stack purchasing timeline, when would that be expected, the student purchasing, and so on? 
I think that is something that, again, depending on what more information you identify tonight or in the near future of what else would be helpful to you. Kari, I'm getting to this, uh, your question here. Um, also, I mean, and would you like to, for us to continue exploring this? Um, but again, what information would be helpful to you? I, I do believe this is where we need to go, but, um, and it's gonna take, as Jan alluded to, um, we haven't even started even a, a greater network of our stakeholders in this conversation yet as well. So before we get there, really want that direction um, because, yeah, that's a major step of really starting then to engage the many stakeholders, beginning with our staff in this project. I would just add that we really need to have a Vanguard team at every building, and we need to begin that now. Um, so if this goes forward, principals and um, our lead educators will be invited into that team to help begin the discussions. There's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid for our educators. If you're interested, what we would have to do is get busy on a very specific funding and fiscal plan for this. Um, to put, again, I can't really project and give you a definite timeline, Ms. Treadway, on your question. It would really, of course, it's going to come back to a fiscal sustainable plan, and um, uh, we don't have that yet for this <laughs> evening. And so, again, looking for something that, yes, this is the way because we, you know, we've we've kind of tossed around the bring your own device um, as well. And now, really, for myself, I think um, in listening to the conversation over time and what I'm learning, I feel that this really is the way that we need to go. How soon are we gonna get there? That's gonna depend. I, I don't have a question, just more of a comment. I, I really like to see that we're investing in the infrastructure to go forward. I'm not a fan, I've not been, and I'm not gonna be a fan of bring your own technology, and I made that very clear. But I am a huge proponent of looking at getting a device, a district, provided device in every one of the students. And I mean, I would think that that's where we should invest our time and our resources. Um, that's ultimately where we're gonna have to go. We're already lagging some of our, our peer districts, as you know, I've already been asking a few questions around that. And so certainly, I'm. if we're looking for my direction, it would be really pursue how do we, as quick as possible, develop a plan to get a district provided device in the hands of the, uh, the students. I thank you for that because I think the BYOT is a you know an effort of desperation. I, I've said that all along. <laughs> that's a. Yeah, that's all it's been meant to be though is a stopgap. Let's try mm -hmm. to move something mm -hmm. forward. So, um, Tim, we heard from you as to what your thoughts are as far as what do what do they do moving forward? Kari, you asked the question, but do you have some input? Would you like to see the timeline close between when students or staff and then students? Or are you just? I was just curious about the timeline. I did all Mr. Menninger's comments. I support this greatly. I think it's where we need to go. Not a fan of bringing your own technology, unless it is just a temporary fix or gap. Um, but I also would like to know, with all the um, funding issues that we have currently, we, how and where we're going to repurpose the funds to do this. What are we going to take from? I'd like to bring a proposal forward that might not be. Very, you might want to close your ears when I say this. <laughs> And then it's the fund balance. We'll I miss you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> At, uh, the fund balance, and especially in late with some of the information we got tonight on the uh, fund balance of the school districts around us, and we know what percentage we should have in place and so on and so forth, but I'd be an advocate of spending uh, whatever we thought was appropriate from the fund balance for the next three years or so to get the wireless up and running and getting up and running right <coughs> and getting the, the parts uh, in place where we need to get it. And you also know that the, the better the staff works with the equipment and works with the wireless, the less we'll have to have for IT staff to support them uh, because they, they're all, they all will support each other and they'll go to the person who knows how to use things and it's just like the business world, they support each other all the time and someone knows how to do something really well and another one knows something really well, they, they collaborate. And anytime you can get them up to speed and get them smarter smarter with this equipment, the less we'll have to have uh, uh, some giant IT staff to have them, you know, have 
turn this turn equipment on and so on for it. Because they, they'll pick it up in a hurry, I know they will. And, and wireless is, is the way to go. I don't want to spend another dime on, on buying equipment that's not wireless. That would be foolish, I think. But, uh, and that, that time is coming as well, as you all know. There are efficiencies when you go wireless. You're able to move to the cloud. You're able to do um, a lot of things that we couldn't do before. We've been taking away laptops. We'd like to give laptops so that our teachers can continue to, to learn and, you know, to be able to be mobile, to be anywhere. So, um, it's not, you know, it's not a major change. It's, what it's doing is making what they, what they use now, you know, tethered to something. What they can do now is they can they can be untethered and use the same thing. It's not like it's a major change. It's, it'll be gradual, I think, but I think you have to do it. I, I'm a big fan of wireless. I'm if I could quickly back up to Ms. Treadway's question again, I don't know if I really responded to the sequence, but it would be important we talk about staff first and the successful models that we are seeing, make sure that those devices are in the hands of teachers, I'll just say at least, if not a full year, which perhaps would not be our case, but at least spring. So it gives some time before the end of the year to get some organization, but then you really focus on your summer. We would have, if this would be our case here, we would have some expectations and some opportunities, obviously, for our staff to uh, take full advantage of what we can offer so that they are prepared for students coming in the fall. How, how, do, you, and, how do we address, um, I have one thought on that is, you know, some of the students and some of the teachers are really going to get the ground running with this. What about the ones who aren't, aren't so uh, good at running with that type of equipment environment? I'm afraid, I don't want to hold, I would hate to hold up the, the ones that are want to get the ground running and the students that are very adept at, I mean, I would, I would guess that probably 75, 80 percent of the high school students can, can get, get around in wireless and, uh, and uh, keyless pads and so on very quickly, but I'm just a little worried about the ones that are a little farther behind it. And not only to bring them up to speed, but I don't want to hold kids up that are real advanced to, to wait for the other ones to get up to speed. You know, that might be a little hard to balance, but I'm sure that we can do it. We can do it. We can use a multi-tiered approach. There's always, you know, that whole continuum of early adopters, which you have in this room. Uh, we have the folks in the middle of the road and those that kind of lag behind. But we also have very talented educators who are willing to help each other. We have very talented students at both the middle and the high school who could become our troubleshooters and actually take a course. I've talked to Zach Sproyers. Um, mom yesterday by phone about opportunities for our high school students to be part of this whole process if it comes to be. They can take courses. They can be involved in a Gen Y program that helps provide during the, the school day support for anyone having trouble with the devices. So I have no doubt that well, we can I'm, solve these I'm always challenges. asking my 10 year old grandson to help me with my telephone. So I know yeah. that yeah. <laughs> support you. Mrs. Mayor, um, I love everything you said, and, and had I been on school board three, four years ago, I would have loved everything you said when I think your whole team put this plan together. And I feel strongly that all the monies that we're talking about are making up for some lost time in your budget. And that clearly shows when you travel from school district to school district, and teachers from other districts come to Holman and try to find their wireless, um, I'm sorry, but it's almost a joke to that. No, it is. It's, they can't believe how far behind. And I see heads nodding, those of you who have friends in other districts. And, and I understand why those choices were made. I'm not criticizing past decisions, but I'm just saying because the sacrifice in that department was made, I strongly support um, this first step. And in response, you know, to Mr. Carlson, like, would I like for you to get the next steps ready for me? I'd like it yesterday. Yes, the sooner you can put that together so that we can begin to struggle with financial decisions that we're going to have to make. Um, yes, and thanks to all of you. I don't know, if, could you just raise your hand if you're in the audience and you were part of the plan at one time or another so I can see the faces of teachers and staff who worked so hard on this. Thank you for that work because I'm sure you got big dollars for that. <laughs> yeah. You may know there are all the nodders in the back. There yeah. are the nodders in the back, so it's like. <laughs> Here he was on Pete that Seeger plan. once yes, said I the was, best paycheck is hugs and kisses. I'll give you hugs and kisses later, but thanks for that work. So yeah, bring the next step 
to us. Thanks for the work on grants, too, because that's yeah. a creative way of helping, and we'll need we'll need that to keep coming. And Mrs. Jagosinski, uh, I would I would echo everything Kate said and everything Tim and Kari said, and I don't. I don't. I whispered to Cheryl when you started talking. I don't need them to continue to explore anything. <laughs> Let's just get going. I mean, working in West Salem and and seeing what they're doing. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of things that we were afraid of at the beginning of the school year, like what if, and so many things that we we worried about and we still worry about, and things that we encounter every day. Um, but you work through them, and and I do think that though, although. I think that staff are capable of helping other staff and students would be capable of helping other students. You are going to need more IT support because that's the one thing I think we could use more of in West Salem. You, I don't think you ever have enough IT support for all the issues that come up. But boy, I'd say like Kate said, get it done yesterday. I'm really glad you're presenting this tonight and I love seeing you smiling and looking hopeful <laughs> while you're sitting up there for once, Jen. That's really nice. Yay! You can clap. <laughs> I'm excited. excited. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess I can talk more from experience with, with electronics. Uh, my first job was in the Navy as an aviation electronics technician. And when I think of the, the things that have van advanced in science and in industry uh, by way of electronics, it's, it's, we're, we're seeing it right now, but I think it's going really head over heels. And I think we have to, just one thing, we have to be real careful. But we don't get on any dead end roads, you know. Mm -hmm. We have to really, really look at the things that are coming, and will they continue to go? Uh, Hewitt Packer was one of the, the big names in aviation electronics at, at the time. That's this is 60 years ago, but they're still producing. So there, there's a, there's a sound. Uh, Douglas Aircraft is no longer. McDonald is no longer. So I mean, these are things that have come and gone. So. That's what we have to be careful of. Good, good points. Well, and I am feeling like this is deja vu. I remember when the technology referendum passed, and the big concern there was how do we get our staff, all of our staff, on board because we were moving from Apple to PCs and to get them the right training. And we did that. The, a good chunk of that technology money the first couple of years was spent doing that and staff bought into it and participated at great levels where they would hit one plateau threshold and then another and another and you know it, it wasn't hard to get them on board to, to, um, to welcome that technology that we of course assumed would be a big deal to try to get them all to come on board and do and so as the years went by my concern is that I know we're talking about repurposing the six hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and what we saw happen with that um, referendum money was that it was repurposed to staff um, you know benefits salaries and benefits and that I know some have said that was what they thought the purpose of that referendum question was but it was for software and hardware with some acknowledgement that there would have to be some cost for those salaries and benefits but not to the level where it was two hundred and 40,000 of the 424,000 that we had and you know where it's half of it so I'm hoping that when we talk about that 600 to 750 that the question would be is some of that coming from that referendum dollars are you actually just talking about 350 <coughs> are you talking about in addition to and that would be helpful information to share at the board I don't expect an answer today but then also maybe outlining now so that it's clear how much of that is for staffing and support, professional development, and what percentage of those dollars then would be for buying new technology and new initiatives? Because that's the only way, if we have that solid, that 75% or 65% of that is for new technologies, that's the only way we're going to keep up because those other things will start to creep into that. And so yeah. that would be something I'd like to see us kind of identify and do. And I agree with the staff first, but too far in advance, the technology will almost be a, you know, a year, year and a half. It's almost old technology by that time. So I think that's something we have to come to terms with. And I suspect what Anita said is true. You know, there's going to be so many concerns and worries that we won't be able to answer all those, but I think to go 
forward, not jump into shallow water with our eyes closed, but eyes wide open, knowing that you know we have that um, skill in Jan and others in the audience and others that you know do it professionally, but also they do it with a passion because they know that that's the right thing to do for our students. So. Um, it sounds like everybody here is supporting these initiatives, and so we'd love to see more progress. I do have to offer just one piece of advice from um, experience while watching kids in the hallway. Get the otter box covers because they really are shatterproof. I have seen many iPads drop with the otter box cover, and they're like, oh, it didn't break. <laughs> save, save thousands of dollars worth of iPads. <laughs> We appreciate the comments. Uh, again, don't forget the earlier comments, though, that we share. I mean, this is going to take some work mm -hmm. and some sacrifice. You've heard uh, our needs in transportation, buildings and grounds, maintenance, and instructional services. Those are not going to go away. Those are real issues that we're having, too. But we will get to work. Thank you for the comments and the direction. And well, I think, too, the meeting on Thursday indicated that testing in the future is going to be all technology-based. And we may we need to be ready for that for our students to be able to take that um, to take those tests. So that's another initiative that we saw. That completes thank my you. report. Okay, thank you. Funny to see Jan smile. So <laughs> then, <laughs> moving on to consent agenda items, there are a number of items on the consent agenda. If any, if you would like to have any of those pulled off. <coughs> We could do that at this time. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. I would ask for item 11.4, uh, budget, original budget, to be held out. Okay, 11.4, any other items? Okay, seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items, excluding item 11.4. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items, um, excluding item 11.4. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Then I would entertain a motion to approve agenda item 11.4, 2012-13 budget original. Is there a second? I'll second it. And then discussion. Mr. Menninger, did you have I just want to make a couple of comments. I am going to vote no. Um, I want that to be no reflection on the, the technology stuff tonight. <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't think it goes far enough. Uh, really, it, it kind of stems back to earlier this year around some of the benefits. Um, I think we are overspending, and I do think when we look at our salary and benefits as a percent of total expenditures compared to some of the other districts, we are quite high and I think we could repurpose. So with that, I'm going to vote no this evening. Okay, any other comments or questions? Seeing none, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the 2012-2013 budget original as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay? No. Motion carries. Then moving on to executive session. Mrs. Treadway, would you read the executive motion? Is there a second? Sorry. Is there a second? Second. second. And then if you would do the roll call, Mrs. Treadway. Yes. Joe Gittins? Yes. Joe Hancock? Yes. 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 And we will take about a three to four minute break and come back into closed session.